You're listening to TGI Sports Talk with your host, Keith Angle, on Northeast Streaming Sports. Good morning, everybody. Keith Angle for TGI Sports Talk in the Northeast Streaming Sports Network. And we certainly want to welcome our viewers on Zodiac TV. Let us... Great stuff going on on Northeast Streaming Sports and Zodiac TV, which certainly affects this show and all of my viewers. We're going to be on so many outlets now. So we've got Zodiac TV. We've got we've got TGI Sports Talk on both Facebook and YouTube. And we've got uh, Northeast Streaming Sports on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, gosh, and all the uh, podcast stations like iHeartRadio, Spotify. Pretty much anything you can think of, we're there. So keep joining, keep watching. I thank all of you for joining me uh, each Friday morning, each Sunday morning, each whatever morning I'm on now. My schedule seems to, seems to keep uh, growing. Good morning, Dave Gayette. You finally made it back to number one in the room. Congratulations. Not a bad day here in East Greenbush, guys, uh, compared to what we've had recently with some snow and some sleet. Uh, we are still the only live streaming sports webcasting East Greenbush, New York. So thank you for that. We're growing leaps and bounds. The followers have doubled in the last, gosh, two months, six weeks. So I thank you guys for that. I thank the groups that allow me to share this too, uh, the, the, these interviews too. And, you know, if, there, if it's, this is being shared, there's something relevant for you. I want to thank my guest from last week, Larry Sorensen, a uh, former major league uh, pitcher with the, with the Brewers, the Cardinals, the A's. Um, Larry got around a little bit in his career, and I want to thank him. It was a great, uh, great interview. He's now uh, the broadcaster for uh, Wake Forest Baseball and football. He's the color commentator. So with that said, what I want to do is bring in today's guest is Daryl Knowles. If you saw my little promo, Daryl pitched a long time in the major leagues, also pitched with a lot of uh, teams um, and very well. Left-handed reliever. We'll talk a little bit about how that came about. I guess he was left-handed from birth. I guess I won't ask him how he became left-handed. Um, but I, I would say Daryl's biggest claim to fame, and maybe he'll dispute me, I don't know, would be being part of the three-time world champion uh, A's from 72 to 74. Certainly a colorful group. And we'll get into that in all of Daryl's career and see where we go from there. So let me see if I can get Daryl in the room. Good morning, Daryl Knowles. How Good are you? Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be here. Excellent. I appreciate you coming on my show today and, and bringing some of that Florida warmth up here to us <laughs> old folks in upstate New York. <laughs> so, Daryl, let's talk about it. I mean, you got you grew up in Missouri, right? Um, yeah, correct. Brunswick, Brunswick High School. Ended up going to the University of Missouri. I mean, did, what were your aspirations? Did you think you were going to be a major league pitcher? What were you thinking as growing up and playing ball in high school? Well, from from the time I was old enough to remember, I always wanted to be a major league baseball player. And and uh, I grew up listening to the Cardinals uh, in Missouri. And, and I just never thought it was not going to happen. And uh, uh, I was lucky enough, had some ability and come out of a small town like Brunswick you're talking about. But, yeah. but uh, I had success everywhere I pitched. Obviously, I wasn't playing against uh, pro, pro caliber players at that point, but but uh, it just it just blossomed. It mushroomed, and uh, uh, I was able to do what I had to do, and just moved up the ladder, and and uh, it all worked out. You know, it's funny. I had Mark Littell. I don't know if uh, you remember the name Mark Littell. He was from he's from the, the Brunswick seems to ring a bell. It was he? He wasn't from Brunswick, was he? Was he from he nearby? Was from, uh, why do I want to say Sykeston, Missouri, or something like that? He was he was from Missouri somewhere, but he wasn't Brunswick. No, Brunswick, Brunswick. No, maybe some maybe something came up in his uh, his early career uh, where he uh, crossed paths with Brunswick. Maybe that's, that's what it was. possible. He was a fun interview. He was a character too. Good major league page, pitcher as well. Yeah, for a long time. Um, yes. So, I'm assuming you pitched at the University of Missouri. Actually, Missouri. no, no. That's that's oh, kind yeah. of a. Uh, I, well, I went to the University of Missouri one semester is all, and uh, okay. and 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 I actually dropped out. Uh, I didn't want to. <laughs> it sounds terrible, but I didn't want anything to do with college. Uh, I just wanted to play ball, and and uh, 
So I, I did. I dropped out. I, my grades were terrible anyway. I, I had no interest in it. Then. But uh, uh, they, they always say I went to the University of Missouri, and it sounds like I'm, I'm this big scholar or something, and that's not the case. <laughs> not the case. You know what? You learn more in the school hard, hard knocks than you learn in uh, this classroom, in my opinion, anyway. At least things that are life important, right? Exactly. So, yeah. so all right. So you, you're, you spend a semester at uh, Missouri, but uh, you get signed by the Orioles. Why the Orioles? Were there other organizations interested or – well, back then, back then there was no draft. I mean, right. uh, I I had a few clubs following me, but uh, this this one scout who was with the Orioles by the name of Byron Humphreys, uh, he always followed me. He was everywhere, every, everywhere I'd go pitch, he would be there. It seemed like, and and finally, uh, uh, he he offered me a contract, and and I wound up taking it. And and he took pretty good care of me. I got uh, I signed for five thousand dollars. Back then, it was still it was still a lot of money, but it was a lot of money. And he, but he put a little clause in the contract that if I got on a major league roster, I'd get an extra twenty five hundred dollars. And after one year, I was put on the major league roster, and uh, uh, and I had I had success in the minor leagues everywhere I went. And and as I said, so it just it allowed me to just move up the ladder, and it all worked out. Well, you did play in the minor leagues. We talked a little bit before we came on, uh, not too far from me. It's, I guess, maybe three hours, uh, Rochester, uh, with the Rochester Red Wings, that's, who I think are still there. I know there's been some there's, there's There's a club in Rochester, but I don't know if they're called the Red Wings anymore or not. But back yeah. then it was Baltimore's AAA, and I think now it's the Minnesota or somebody. I'm not even sure. How much time did you spend there? One year. Uh, actually, one, year. one and a half. Uh, uh, I I played one year there, but I had a I, I pulled a hamstring real bad and tried to pitch with it all year, and it just didn't work. You know, I was in and out and mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of success. But uh, uh, I did when I was healthy, but when I was hurt, and obviously I did not. But then I went back the next year, and then they 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 called me up, and uh, uh, I, I that was the, that was the biggest thrill I ever had in in baseball. Obviously, it was getting going to the big leagues, but sure. Uh, and I wasn't really successful the first time I went up, but but I was bound to go back. So. Did you have uh, was there Weaver one of your managers in the minor leagues? Yes, he was. When I played double A ball, he was he was the manager and uh, uh, great great guy. I mean, you talk about a fiery guy. Obviously, yeah. everyone knows that, but yeah, but, uh, Hall of Famer and yeah, he was a he was a good baseball guy, and and we all learned a lot from Earl. Even though I mean, half of it was. You you knew when he was going to get mad, and uh, he he and the umpires didn't get along, but it didn't matter, you know. It, so you would say that the, the Earl Weaver we came to know as the Orioles manager for 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 a long long time. He was the same guy back in nineteen same guy, absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good. Um, and and at that time, I mean, were you a relief pitcher then, or were you a starter? Because I know you had some starts here and there through the, your major league career. But what what, what was the, what was the path for for Daryl Knowles then? No, I was always a a, a starter in the minor leagues, and uh, uh, then when I got to the big leagues, it was just back in those days. Everybody kind of kind of started in the in the bullpen when you got to the big leagues, and you worked your way back into the starting. And and I wanted to start because uh, I'd done that all through my minor league career, but. Uh, Right away, at, at my first full year in the big leagues was with the Phillies, and Gene Mock was the manager, and he just stuck, he just stuck me in the bullpen and and made me a closer, and so it just it kind of stuck, and I loved it. I loved being in the in in the game at the right time, and that was you know when it's on the line, that's when you want to be there. So at that point in time, your your aspirations to be a starting pitcher kind of disappeared. For, no, for uh, but but I I didn't really have a choice. I mean, it was. <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the the one good thing about being a reliever, you have a chance to pitch every day. And yeah. I didn't mind that at all. I like that. So uh, it's a little different than it is today. Well, you did very well once you get in there. You know, the thing, the advantage you had as a reliever, at least, you know, as the game evolved, and I'm sure it wasn't, well, maybe it wasn't that much different then. I mean, when you're left-handed, you got an advantage as well because there just aren't that many good left-handed pitchers around it, it seems. No, uh, and I, it, it, being left-handed probably kept me in the big leagues a couple of years longer because I had great success against left-handed hitters and obviously being left-handed. And so that kept me around a little bit. But uh, uh, the first 13 years, if you will, uh, I didn't care whether they're right-handed, left-handed, whatever. It didn't matter. And uh, 
Uh, well, you, cer you certainly handled yourself handled yourself well. You talk about your time in Philadelphia, and you did kind of come of age there. And again, right. you know, we talked about Earl Weaver. You played for another iconic manager in Gene Mock. Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe for different reasons in a lot of cases. But Gene Mock managed for a long time in the major leagues for, and he didn't ever get the ring. But what was it like uh, playing for Gene Mock? Gene was Gene was a different type guy, and I was I didn't care who managed. It was my first full year in the big leagues. I was just happy to be there, but, uh, he was, he and Jim Bunning used to always uh, go at it. And Bunning was not a big fan of his cause he just didn't think Gene handled pitching well, even though he was a great manager and he could handle the game well, but Jim wasn't uh, happy with the way he handled all the pitching. And, and for me, I didn't care cause he let me pitch and, and, yeah. uh, and he just, he threw me out there and he kind of made me be the, closer that I was and uh, that, that, that I became, I should say. But Yeah. Well, those first couple of years in the majors, you, you, you only spent a year in Philadelphia and a year in Baltimore, but I mean, you played with some great players uh, in Baltimore. You had Brooks Robinson was there and Boo oh, Powell, yeah. the young player, Louis Aparicio. And you get to the Phillies, you got Bunning, as you mentioned, uh, Richie or yeah. Dick Allen. I'm not sure what he was called at that point in time. I don't remember. Well, yeah, <laughs> but we, we called him Richie player. back then. Yeah, he was kind of a, uh, I, I'm not sure, mercur, mercurial player, right? Um, he and, could hit. Uh, yeah, he could certainly hit the baseball. Uh, who was who are the influences as you're, as you're growing into your career now, these first couple of years? You mentioned Gene Mock um, making a reliever or whatnot. Were there other coaches or players that were influential in, in your development at that time? Well, after the, the year I spent in, in, in Philly, I got traded to the uh, Washington Senators. And uh, Gil Hodges was the manager there, and, and yeah. he kind of he kind of really blossomed my career, if you will, as as a closer. Because uh, I remember I went to him in spring training and told him told him I wanted to start, and uh, and he he sat me down. We had a long talk, and he did most of the talking. But uh, but I realized that uh, you know I was going to be a reliever. I was going to be their closer, uh, which I was, and and uh, uh, it turned out it turned out perfect. And I kind of think back on, I think they, they, they must've known more than I did. And uh, I didn't yeah. want to admit that at the time, but, uh, yeah. but it certainly was that way. Well, when you get to Washington, your career really, I mean, you had pitched well in Philadelphia as you, mm -hmm. as you talked about, uh, but you get to Washington, your career really blossoms. You play, you only got to play for Hodges for a year, isn't it? Uh, but, was it yeah. 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 Cause then he went to the Mets, but, uh, yeah. Uh, the next year, I think it was the next year, 67 is the year that I wound up having to go to Japan. And, uh, I was in the, I was in the military and, uh, well, thank you for your service, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, it was, it was a great experience. I certainly didn't want to go over there. I was just now becoming, a, a established, if you will, in the major leagues. And then, uh, the air air national guard unit I was in got activated and I wound up in Japan. I was on active duty for 18 months. But I still pitched a little bit when I was at Andrews Air Force Base. So before yeah, I, I went overseas, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say you didn't really miss a full season, right? Well, no, I would go to the base in the morning and then go to the ball game at night. And uh, uh, I would, I would, I, I pitched, it seemed like every day I was there. I think I was in 30 some ball games in a half yeah. a year. And, uh, but it was, it was a, a strange time because uh, there was a, you know, the, the, the Vietnam war was going on and, and yeah. uh, I could, I could have wound up there. I, you know, but I was luckily I did not have to go there. Well, that's good. Yeah. So, and in Washington, as I said, you bl really blossomed. And in fact, you had your, an all-star year in uh, 1970. Is that right? 69, 69, 69. Yeah. Uh, what, what was that like playing with all the, I mean, all-star games then, and I guess they are today, but they don't feel the same. Maybe it's because we see the guys every day on Sports Center. There's games around here every night, but back in those days, all-star games were they felt special because you did as a fan, you didn't get to see all these players, and and you weren't playing against the guys in the American League as a player, right? Like they are today. What was it like being around that? You know, I I remember sitting in the clubhouse and looking around, and and you see all these guys, and they're all stars, and and uh, I I felt very honored just to be a part of them, and and uh, did not even imagine that I'd pitch in the game, but I did wind up getting in the game, and facing a couple of hitters, got them both out. So uh, 
but just to watch him. And Frank Howard, by the way, was on that club too. Hit hit yeah. a couple. I think he hit. He might. I know he hit one home run. He might have hit two in that game. But but it was it was a different time. And, and I don't know because it, it was in Washington, which is where I was playing. Yeah. And uh, when they, I I remember coming in the game, and that's the biggest applause I ever got in my life. And it seemed like every every fan there was a big Washington Senator fan, and uh, uh, they really they 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 brought me in right and and made me think. But, I know it was a long time ago, but do you remember who the two guys were you got out? Absolutely, Matty Lou and uh, oh, ooh, who's the shortstop for Boston Red Sox back then? Oh, yeah. I'm um, sorry. Yeah. Rico Petroselli. Rico Petroselli. Yeah. I think those are yeah. the two I faced. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You would think you'd remember that, uh, yeah. that moment in your life, right? Yeah. Did you enjoy, I mean, your time in Washington, I mean, it was probably your longest stint. Um, Oakland was close, but I think it was your longest stint with a club. And you obviously played for multiple managers and people with different personalities. Uh, I'm sure Ted Williams and, and Gil Hodges were kind of worlds apart, but uh, they were, they were that. Yeah. Uh, Ted was, Ted, I've always said was, had, has more, he had more charisma than any man I've ever met in my life. He was not the best manager at that time, but I, it was like, I couldn't wait to get to the ballpark every day just to listen to him. And uh, just to think that Ted Williams, I mean, he was, he was just, he was bigger than himself. I mean, it, he could walk in a room and just take it over and, and never say a word. And uh, he was not, like I said, at that time, he wasn't a, the best manager I ever played for, but he was certainly the most interesting. You know, it's funny. It seems like great players, just to go sideways here a little bit, it seems like great players often don't translate into great managers. And I, and I always wonder why that is. I mean, there's been some. I, I don't want to sure. say nobody ever has. But it seems like it's hard, and I don't know if it's because they expect too much of their players, or or they're too aloof. I mean, I know I've read about Ted Williams that he was a little bit aloof, and and, and you can probably speak to that better than I can, obviously. But and he wasn't really, um, he didn't have the best um, interpersonal relationships with the players. <laughs> no, he didn't. Does that sound I mean, right? I, I will say this about about Ted. I mean, Ted was a, a Ted knew hitting, obviously, and sure. And, and when you would when people would talk to him, he'd say, I know about those pitchers. I know about pitching, you know, but he, he knew how to hit them, but he didn't know how to handle them, you know, and, and yeah. at that time, but he got, I will say to his credit, he got better, but, uh, but he was, he was, he would go help the opposing hitters. And we used to, we used to always get on and what are you doing? You know? And, 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 oh, well, you know, he, he, uh, very colorful, colorful, colorful mouth. I mean, uh, yeah. he'd curse, he'd cursed. Oh, <laughs> bad, bad, but, but he was, he was different. He was different, but I, it's, it, it's a great chapter in my life. I was, I'm thrilled now that I got to play for him. I'll tell yeah. you how smart I was. I played for him there and uh, talked to him a million times, never got his autograph. Oh, no kidding. I, I, I wasn't very smart back then. I mean, uh, I got, I have a picture with him, but I, I did, did not get him to autograph. Well, I guess in that kind of person, that relationship, I mean, it doesn't seem natural just to go up and to ask your your boss for his autograph. Probably, I'm guessing it doesn't come to second nature. Like if you were a fan that ran across him. Well, that's probably true, but and that was probably the case. But I know a lot of guys did, and I just didn't want to. I don't know. I took the stance I didn't want to bother him. You know, I just yeah. if I needed something, I would ask him. But uh, yeah. the 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 press was all over him everywhere. I mean, and rightly so. Rightly so. Yeah. Well, these first, uh, gosh, uh, five, six years of your career, you're, you're, you're not playing with teams that are competing for pennants, unfortunately. And that all changed with the trade to the the uh, the rising Oakland A's at that time. They weren't quite the A's that they became, but you get traded in a big trade with, uh, I know Mike Epstein went in that trade and Don Mincher came the other way. I don't remember all the uh, uh, the pieces of that trade. You might, you might uh, remember them, but. I what, do. Was, what were your thoughts about that trade? <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny you ask because I was very upset when I got traded because yeah. I, I was, uh, how do I say this correctly? I was like a, 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 a big, big, uh, big guy in the bullpen, if you will. And I was, I was the guy and I knew going to Oakland, I was not going to be, and I was very upset. They had this other guy with this curly mustache that kind of got all this, all the save opportunities, but, 
He was okay, right? Yeah, he kind of he wound up okay, but <laughs> <laughs> he would. Uh, uh, it was. It, I was out there about a week or ten days, and I think it just kind of hit me. Hey, this club's got a chance to win, and and I'd never in in my years the year with the the Phillies we competed, but we did, obviously didn't win. Washington, we never had a chance to win. Just wasn't that good. But all yeah. of a sudden with Oakland, we could see that we did have a chance. Good, you talk about good young ball players. I mean, that whole I, I was just like a a spoke in a big wheel out there, and and but it all meshed together, and and uh, with fingers being the ace out there, obviously, and then I was the guy that kind of uh, set him up, if you will, most of the time. He got thirty saves, I'd get twelve, you know. So, yeah. uh, but he was he was a fun guy, and he still is, and he's still a good friend. Still a good friend. Well, the guys, that's good to hear. And those guys who set up guys like fingers, like you did, I mean, they're, <laughs> those are huge parts of the ball game too. I mean, you can't get to fingers without holding the guys. Uh, I mean, I, I get crazy with some of the stats today. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit uh, later, but I mean, <laughs> guys who are, who are in your position today, they get stats called holds, right? And it's yeah. one of the most infuriating stats that's ever come along for me <laughs> because you're going to have an eight run lead and give up seven runs and you've got a hold. And I don't really understand how that's a successful no. lottery, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I feel the same way. I don't, don't quite understand all that stuff, but uh, it's, it, it's, it's frustrating. So, the, so the A's uh, obviously, as I said, you come to a winning, uh, a more winning atmosphere as they're, they're on the rise. And they make the playoffs your first year and get, you, you do get swept by your old team, the Baltimore Orioles. Exactly. Um, but you could see that team had something and, and it was just a matter of time before they broke through. Did you feel that way in 71 that this team was going to win? Absolutely. I mean, uh, the, even, even back then you knew that the, with the, with the pitching we had and, and obviously the stars in the field and you're talking about guys like Reggie and Rudy and all, I mean, Bando, uh, Campanaris, all those guys, Dick Green, who was probably one of the most, uh, uh, important guys on that team because great defensive player, right? Oh, great, great defensive player. But, uh, uh, but anyway, you knew that, that they had a chance and, and they were, they were going to compete as long as that team stayed together. And, and luckily the next year they, well, we did, even though I wasn't part of that, uh, world series team, but yeah, you got hurt that year. Uh, the, during- my last game of the season, uh, I've, <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> embarrassing, but I, I broke my thumb my left thumb, I, I, I hit, I was hitting and hit a ball. It was in extra innings actually. And I thought when I hit the ball, I thought that's, that's going to be a base hit. And I was going to, I tried to hustle to, I was going to go to go to second and get a double. And, uh, I slipped coming out of the batter's box and stuck my finger, finger down and broke my thumb. So I missed the playoffs and world series. So, but that was probably the, roughest time for me uh, in my whole career because I thought here we got a chance maybe to play in a world series and I'm, I'm not going to be a part of it. So. Yeah, that had to be hard. I mean, that was an exciting world series. I remember that uh, yeah. very vividly I mean, I was fairly young yet, but it was, uh, I remember it very vividly. I mean, it seems like every game was one run and or close to it. And, and uh, the team really came through. Uh, Reggie didn't play in that World Series either, no, right? No, he did not. In the yeah. uh, clinching game of the the playoffs, he uh, he tore his tore his leg up and and uh, scoring on a play and and uh, and he wasn't yeah he didn't play either. But but it was the the ball club rose above Reggie and myself, even though yeah. Reggie was probably a bigger part of it than I was. But but I had a great year that year, and and uh, as did Reggie and everybody else. But uh, uh, he made a big show out of it when he didn't, didn't, uh, <laughs> when he was introduced, he actually, I laugh I, and, and I love Reggie. Don't, don't get me wrong. But when they, when they introduced us, even though I, I was there for the introductions, but with a cast on my arm and everything, but, and Reggie, yeah. Reggie come out on crutches. And I remember. Out. Yeah. And, and <laughs> as soon as, as soon as he got back to the dugout, the crutches were gone. It was crazy, but <laughs> well, Reggie was a different kind of character. Hey, he was. He still is. Still, is. He's a good teammate. Teammate. was he a good teammate? I mean, I as a Yankee fan, I mean, I know of his time here, and I know of his time sure. obviously in other places, but you didn't seem to hear. I know, and and from reading, I know things did go on in Oakland similar to what went on in New York. Um, what was your what was your relationship like with Reggie? 
Reggie was fun. He was just back then. He was uh, uh, a little more egotistical than he is now. Uh, yeah. But I actually, I made a quote, and it turned out to be quite big. But I, I actually said to him, I said, "There's not enough mustard in the world to cover that hot dog." <laughs> and about five years later, it's printed in the in the paper or something. In the, uh, but Reggie, Reggie remembered it. We talk about it every now and then. Daryl, listen, you should have copyrighted that statement because people have been <laughs> using it for players ever since. You're right. You're right. <laughs> you may, if you had made a, a, a quarter for every time that's been uttered, you'd be, a, you'd be I know. You'd be, you'd be living at Mar Lago now. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, uh, the other thing I want to chat about quickly about it is 72. You were yeah. still with the team during the playoffs in the World Series, yes. as you mentioned, right? Yes. Um, Let's talk a little bit that that series with Detroit before you, they got to the mm -hmm. to the uh, to the uh, World Series was pretty. There was a lot of animosity going on in that series, and there was a famous incident with uh, Bert Campanaris and Laren Legro. Um, what's your recollection of that? Did Billy start the whole thing? I mean, what was what was your recollection? Well, was that was that that year when 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 yeah. uh, Campy threw the bat? Was that seventy yeah. two? It was seventy two. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, that game was in Oakland. That that game you're talking about, and and uh, and Campy just had a great game. He was doing everything and stealing bases, base hits. I think he might hit a home run. Uh, he was he just took over that ball game. It seemed like, and then when when Legro hit him, and it was obviously everybody knew it was Billy. Billy Billy uh, ordered him to do it, but that's Campy. Campy doesn't. It, again, I love Campy too, but uh, Campy doesn't he didn't like pain very much. And no. <laughs> when that ball hit him, he just erupted, you know. And and, and well, then like, he missed. Did he even think missed, about it? No, but he missed part of the playoffs after that too. And uh, so we were probably lucky to win that playoff. Uh, yeah. But, uh, Gene Tennis came up big in that last game, and uh, and then he obviously had a great World Series. So yeah. Came out of nowhere. Yeah. Really. I mean, for the nation, I mean, people in Oakland probably knew Dean Tennis, but for the, around the nation, I remember that first game of the World Series, he gets two home runs. I'm, yeah. I'm at, even at my young age, I'm like, who the heck is Gene Tennis? But, <laughs> uh, you know, he became a household name after that, obviously. He did. So. And you know what? It kind of, it, it, it kind of really allowed him to take off. After that, he was always, uh, he was always in the mix and, and, uh, he contributed a lot, believe me. He was he was he was one of them along with along with Reggie and Rudy and and yeah. tennis and and it was there's so Vandor. many great players. Yeah. yeah, so many great players on that team. You always leave somebody out just because there was a great player. That's the right. Pitching, the pitching staff was amazing, both the starters and the bullpen. It it uh, was. And, and you had, you know, there were there's three Hall of Famers came off of that club and yeah and, uh, probably a couple others that could be talked about, but uh yeah. Uh, I don't think Rudy gets enough credit from the days he played. And, uh, and then Fosse was a pretty stabling catcher, you know, the last three years there. And, and I mean, he just, he, he took care of the, the pitching staff and, and it all went well, but we got to remember one thing. The manager was a guy by the name of Dick Williams, another yeah. Hall of Famer. And he played for some great pit managers, man. I did. I did. And he was probably my favorite of all time. And, uh, what made him uh, separate him from the others? Well, he would let you play, but he demanded you play the game the way it's supposed to be played. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't, he would let you know. It. And everybody respected that out of him. And and nobody questioned anything he ever said. And but he was the leader of the ball club, and as rightly so. Uh, but he 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 could handle pitching. Uh, and I think when you have great pitchers on a ball club, as many as they did in Oakland back in then with Vida and Cat and Fingers yeah. and, and, you know, Blue Moon and all those guys. It's just – Harold Knowles. Don't forget Darrell Oh, uh, well, I was, I was happy to be a part of it. But uh, <laughs> but he knew, and, and nobody ever got tired. He just – he could take care of everybody, and, and, and that, was the, that was the best. Uh, uh, if there's any questions, he didn't – he didn't uh, – he didn't – he didn't not – run the game. He always was in control. And I think that's a, and he wasn't a big Finley fan either. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story where, where Charlie used to come to the games. Occasionally he'd sit up in the boxes 
And he would call down to the dugout and tell Dick he wanted to do something. And and for some reason, I was just happened to be in there. I don't know whether I'd gone to the restroom or what, but I was in the dugout and the phone rang. And and Joe Romo, our trainer, picked up the phone and answered, and it was Finley. And he said, uh, uh, Dick, it's Charlie wants to talk to you. And I remember uh, Dick said, tell him I'm not here. <laughs> and he's sitting there looking at him, you know, so it was great. But uh, uh, he didn't want to be bothered. When the game started, it was all Dick. You know, as, as a Yankee fan, you know, obviously we heard, obviously know all about the George Steinbrenner years and, and yeah. his – his interference with managers and whatnot and calling dugouts. and But Charlie Finley was Dick George Steiner before George Steinbrenner, it, it feels right. like. You know, I mean, we couldn't – we couldn't we, we had like three different uniforms, and every day when we were home, we couldn't get dressed until Charlie called. He'd call from Chicago to her, well, we're wearing green today or something. I mean, we always had to wait. It was it was crazy, but but you know what? You got to give the guy a little credit too. I think he put together a pretty doggone good ball club, and uh, he was, even though he was colorful and nobody, the nobody liked the way he did things, but it was all, yeah. uh, it was all winning, and uh, that that part he did well. You know, I've read a lot that uh, one of the things that contributed to the team doing so well over those years would. Well, the thing, a thing that united the team was their hatred for Charlie and that yeah. helped them because they hated – you guys had – I will, you shouldn't say hated each other. You, you had some issues at different times, different players. Oh, had there, there were some issues, yeah. There were some – all those fights and everything you, you heard about, I, I'll go right on, on air right here and tell you they're all true. They all yeah. happened. But when the game started, everybody played the way it's supposed yeah. to be, so – and was that you united the front against Charlie? Was that something that really uh, uh, put the, brought the team together? Well, it started, you know, it started the year before with with Vida after he <clears throat> had the great year, and then he didn't he held out, and Charlie didn't want to play, and that kind of started. But then after we won it uh, in '72, uh, and he gave us a nice World Series ring, you know, we got, and and when he gave gave us the ring, and you've probably read this somewhere, but he he told us and everybody remembered it. He said, win it again and I'll make that ring look sick. Well, I did. <laughs> we did win it again. And that was the year of Mike Andrews thing when, uh, you know, yeah. he tried to release Mike Andrews during the world series and everybody backed Mike and went against, uh, Charlie, uh, and made it publicly pu public known. And so when he got the rings, there was not even a diamond in the ring. And I've been to the Hall of Fame. Have you ever been there? I'm sure you have. Oh, yeah, many times. Yeah. Many you times. know, they have all the rings in that case. That's yeah. the only ring in there that doesn't have a diamond in it. It's crazy. But, so yeah, everybody, that, that kind of – that that made everybody go against Charlie. But let's talk since we're talking. So before we finish with Charlie, there's a question. I was going to bring this up anyway. Uh, uh, when when the, the owner paid the players to grow mustaches, and let me yeah. – uh, let me put a little picture up here quickly of uh, we can see that. <laughs> oh, well, here's, yeah. Darryl, here's you, Daryl, before you got your mustache. And yeah. I guess you know, oh, I can't change it there. Let me see if I can find You can see one here where you've got your mustache. Did you grow it just to get the money or? Uh... Well, the, I'll tell you the whole story on this thing. It all started because of Reggie. In spring training, Reggie, uh, and I, you've, you've probably heard this, but yep. Reggie, Reggie, I had, hear you tell it though. Well, <laughs> Reggie came to spring training with a beard and a mustache, you know, full beard and mustache. And back in those days, it wasn't allowed. You're supposed to be clean shaven. And, uh, yeah. and, and he went to, uh, to, uh, well, Dick Williams was telling him, you got to get rid of it. And, and he asked me, he said, could I keep it? And he said, you can keep the mustache, but, but you got to get rid of the beard, which he did. But when the season started, he was, he was supposed to shave it off. And, he didn't, and so a few of us just said, "Well, we'll start growing them too." And and so we did, and we were. I think we were in Milwaukee and played a game, and then we're going home. And Charlie was on the flight, and he loved the mustaches. I think I want everybody to grow them. And four fifths of the team said, "No, we like growing them." And then he he actually said, "I'll give everybody three hundred dollars to grow one." Well, the next day, the clubhouse guy and every bat boys and everybody are growing mustaches. So 
And he did. He paid, gave everybody three hundred dollars. Or so were you were the one one of the ones that did not want it. Well, at, at the beginning, I wasn't going to grow one, but uh, yeah. when that when it started, yeah, we all did. You know, just I was one of the guys that started. I had a got a pretty heavy beard anyway, and it came in yeah. pretty quick. So, so did Charlie? I mean, did he really like the mustaches? Because I know one of the versions of the story I heard was was to, you know, mitigate Reggie's uh, 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 flagrantly uh, breaking the rules. <laughs> he just said, "Well, I'll have everybody grow," and then Reggie's impact is going to be lessened by that much. Well, I I don't know what what Charlie was thinking about it, but uh, I I don't know whether he liked him or not. But he thought it was a big deal. Then he had the uh, everybody at the ballpark. I think that that uh, there was some deal that if you grew a mustache, he let you in the park free that day. Something yeah, like well, that. You, there was an event like that. Yeah. yeah. But so he was he was probably smarter than everybody thought. But and anyway. and it was yeah, it was certainly um, magnified by the fact that. Again, in 72, you played the clean shaven, uh, you exactly. know, exactly. Yeah. 72 shoes, Cincinnati Reds. So yeah, they, they, they build it the hairs versus the squares, right? Right. One of the great lines, another great line. Was that Monty Moore? I don't know who made that. Do you know who? I, that I, I do not know, but I thought it was a great line. Yeah. I feel like it was Monty Moore. I don't know why. But That's possible. Any, anyway. You win in 72. You don't get to participate. It's a horrible time for Daryl Knowles. I mean, I'm sure you're tapping to team one, but it's got to be hard not to participate, oh, as you said. It was tough. But in 73, the team plays, again, very well, gets to the World Series. And it's another great World Series against the Mets, who it's hard to believe they were even there. I know. Yeah. <laughs> even today, great pitching. But, but Daryl Knowles sets a, a World Series record. Since tied, I think, by Brandon Morrow. But right. at the time, you were the first pitcher ever to pitch in all seven games of a World Series. I couldn't believe that. But um, I just wanted to make sure I got in one ball game in that series because I, yeah. you know, everybody wants to say I pitched in a World Series. And, and I, I was lucky enough, I got, I think I relieved Raleigh and got the save in the first game. Uh, so I was tickled to death. And then I got in, I obviously got in all of them. Uh, but it, the, I didn't, I didn't, Really, I, I always thank Gene Tennis because Raleigh was pitched with two out in the ninth in the seventh game, and I didn't even know until that morning it was something in the paper that if, if by chance I would get in that game, I'd be the only guy to ever do it at that time. But Gene Tennis made an error with two out in the ninth and allowed me to get in the game. I always thank Gino for that. Was it exciting to get uh... – get that last out of a world I, series. That's the biggest thrill I ever had in baseball ever yeah. in any capacity. Yeah. That was, that was something I didn't even, uh, I faced Wayne Garrett, who's still a good friend of mine, but, but, uh, uh he popped up and I didn't even see Campanaris catch the ball. I was, I was ecstatic. You know, it was great. It's a great memory. Great memory. Biggest thrill I ever had. Yeah, and you talked about the uh, the turmoil that kind of surrounded that World Series as well with Mike Andrews uh, and Dick Williams. So I've heard another version. The, the, the version I've always read is that Dick Williams decided during that series and the whole Mike Andrews thing to resign um, after the World Series. I've I've heard a story since that it, he'd, he'd given his resignation weeks and weeks before. Now, I don't – do you have any recollection of being anything di thing different than version A? I only remember version A because after that happened, we went to, we're in New York and, and, um, uh, and he had a meeting and said that win or lose, he was going to resign after the, after the series. Now, whether there, there was something other than that, I don't know, but, uh, uh, that was the first thing anybody heard about it. And, uh, I just assume that's the way it was. And were you guys, will, were you, was the team really willing and uh, able, or not willing and able, but were you ready to set out a game if uh, this didn't go the way you needed it to? With, no, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. But uh, uh, my, my wife just handed me a note. Is that, is that true? In March. Yeah. About Wayne Garrett. Has, has Wayne Garrett passed? March. I did not hear that. Did he? Well, she just passed uh, me a note said he died in March, and I was I'll not aware of that. I'll take a quick look here. Yeah, let's take a quick look. Oh, great TV when Keith looks stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne Garrett. Let's see. Yeah, I, it's funny if I miss that. I usually catch these. Well, I, I'm not. 
I he lived in Sarasota. I'm in Dunedin, Florida. I, March 19th. My wife yeah. was saying it was on March 19th. That's funny. Baseball reference still has them alive, which they're usually pretty good. Wow. I don't know. I'm, I'm with you, but uh, uh, well, let's let's hope not. Hope that's incorrect. Hope not. Yeah, yeah. Wik, Wikipedia still has him alive too. So Wayne, we hope you're still with us. Yeah, Wayne, we do. <laughs> Sorry, I brought that up on air here. That's Sorry, okay. Wayne. That's all right. <laughs> we never know. You know, we're all day to day. So who the heck knows? Yeah, that's so true. I, we might have had breaking news here. That's okay. It might that's have right. been a different Wayne Garrett. I don't know. Hopefully, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll look into that deeper, and I hope not, because I did. You know, I wasn't a Met fan, but I liked Wayne Garrett actually. Oh, uh, great, great guy, great guy. Yeah, I did root for the Mets in that World Series. I'm sorry to say, but uh, it's a hard lot to of do people did. I, think. I mean, they had a they had a great pitching staff. I mean, they really did, and you know, oh, Seager yeah. and Kuzman and uh, Matlack, all those, you know, and Tug McGraw. Yeah, and fortunately, you guys could match them pretty much man for man, though. So that was uh, true, very true. And and uh, yeah, I think it might have been different, but uh, they they brought uh, Yogi brought uh, Seaver back on three days rest to pitch game six, and uh, yeah, which we won. Uh, he wasn't the true Tom Seaver; didn't have that greatest stuff right then. But and if they'd have given him one more day's rest, it might have been different. You don't know. Yep. It might have been, right? It might have been a different game seven yeah. for sure. So so we moved to 74, and Dick Williams obviously resigns, and you've got Alvin Dark now and yet another different personality. My gosh, it seems like every manager you played, it could not have been more different than the last. It's That is true. That is true. You know, we didn't have a manager like until like three days before spring training started. Yeah, yeah. What was it like playing for Alvin? <sighs> You know, Alvin was a great baseball man and, and uh, obviously was around forever, uh, very highly respected. I, I didn't I didn't see eye to eye all the time with Alvin, I'm sorry to say, uh, and probably because I didn't pitch as well for him as I had in the past. But I always I always felt it was because he didn't pitch me as much, you know, and I, I, yeah. I don't know. It's just we had a difference of opinions. And, and uh, but he he was uh, I mean, I tried to tried to uh, handle him with respect. I think he tried to do the same thing. He was a religious guy. Yeah. And so, But he was okay. And, and you know what? We won. And I know some guys said we won in spite of him. And uh, there were some, there were some uh, games where he did things different than what, let's say, Dick would have done. Yeah. And some of the guys, not me, but some of the guys would speak out about it. And uh, – and the writers loved that stuff. I mean, they would, you know, they pick up on it, and and it was just added yeah. to the Oakland A's aura, if you will. Even through all of that, the team wins their third straight World Championship, first time since the Yankees in the fifties. Right. Um, and I think it's only uh, only the Yankees have done it again since then. I I believe that's probably true. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, that was a you know that was a, a short series. I think we won that in five against the yeah. Dodgers and. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mike Mike Marshall, the great Mike Marshall, but uh, only pitched 106 games or something that year. Can can you imagine that happening today? No. Oh my gosh, jeez, <laughs> you kidding me? Uh, it's you know. I guess we'll touch on it quickly today. I mean, how, how is it for you to watch the game today as Ooh. compared to when you played? It's so much different, especially from a pitching standpoint, right? Starting pitchers are trained to start looking for somebody to come and get them after 90 yeah. pitches. I mean, it's a frustrating well, watch. I, it, it it is. The game has changed, and 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 uh, as an old timer, if you will, I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> all the the uh, the stats and all this stuff that they're the an, analytics and it's it to me. It, how do you how do you take a pitcher out because he's he's how about the guy last year in the World Series? Even they did oh my it. gosh, yeah, that was big. I'll never be forgotten. But but. I, I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, now they're playing seven inning double headers and put a guy on second base, and it's just the change of the baseball. game. It's not baseball anymore at that point. No. You no, know, I watch if, if you watch a game that goes to extra innings, and Todd Stottlemyre kind of said this to me uh, as well. I had him on the show. And he's like, "Well, once it gets to the tenth inning, I stop watching because it's not baseball anymore." That's right. Right. <laughs> well, so. I go on and on. Geez, I do my vlogs and I, I rail on this stuff all the time, so I probably shouldn't like. Uh, 
pull you into my sphere, my my sphere of influence, where I, or I'm getting shot down by the the younger generation thinks it's awesome, right? That well, <laughs> Eric Wedge. I'm sure you know who Eric Wedge is. Sure. He, is, sure. Uh, he 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 used to work with the Blue Jays when I was there, and and he always said they just keep messing with the game, you know. And he said it's very disheartening, and it was, it is. But uh, and he's he's now the uh, head coach for Wichita State, I think. So. Oh, is he? Yeah. Oh, good for him. He was a good man, good manager. Good yes. manager. Yeah, a good guy. We're a good guy. Um, you know, it's it's funny. Just to, before we get away from the changes to the game, I mean, it's fun. It didn't just start either yesterday. I mean, it, it going back to your time. Every rule change has been designed to help the hitters and and negate the pitchers, starting with lowering the pitcher mound in yeah. sixty eight or sixty seven. I'm not sure which year it was, but I think it was sixty eight. Yeah. 68. 67, 60. You lower yeah, the model, then, then you got the no, DA. It, it was after uh, uh, Bob Gibson had the great year, you know, and uh, yeah, they lowered it for the next day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in the American League, only there was only one 300 hitter in the American League that year, and that was Carl Yastrzemski. I, I think that's correct. He won a triple crown, I think, that year. Yeah, he did. With, uh, that was 67 right. when that was. Yeah. Oh, 67, right, right, right. Yeah. I do remember he led the league with like a 301 average. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was only 300 hitter. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and not just that, but then the DH comes in and then uh, the baseballs change and yeah. everything has been against the pitchers. So I'm not just saying that because I got a pitcher with me here today either. But- <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I appreciate it. <laughs> so listen, as you move through, I don't want, I don't want to, uh, I, I certainly don't want to shortchange the rest of your career. I mean, after you move on from Oakland, you're still a good pitcher with Chicago. You're the closer there. And mm-hmm. you had some good careers, played with some great players there. Um, Absolutely. Bill Madlock, I know you played with. Um, Rick Russell, some great players. Any Anything that stands out as your, your time in Chicago? I, you know, I remember the, I was there two years, and the, uh, the, the first year, uh, Don Kessinger, come up to me and he said, at the end of this year, you'll be more exhausted than you've ever been in your career because all of the day games, you know, and, and, and he was right. It was, uh, it was tough that first year because all day games. Yeah. And uh, the next year I kind of, I, I mean, I, and I did, I had the worst year I've ever had in baseball stat wise. And the next year I, I put a curfew on myself. I changed things. I just, I did things a lot different. So I came back and had a good year and then they traded me after that. So, to, yeah. Well, you, you did actually when you got traded to Chicago, you actually did get traded for a Hall of Famer. So there's I did. That's right. That's too, right. Billy Williams. So you've got that going for you. And when Chicago moves you, you go to Montreal. And I didn't know this actually until I was doing a little bit more research because I like to dive in a little bit and find little nuggets. You yeah. didn't like your time in Montreal. Uh, well, from what I can first tell. of all, I, I got traded to Texas first, and then I went to Montreal. Was it Texas first. Yeah, and then. Uh, uh, I wasn't, we had a great club in Montreal, great club, yeah. but my family at the time, I had a couple of kids and, and a couple of small kids at the time. And it was just French speaking. And yeah. I just said, I'm getting out of here. I'm, you know, I'm going to go back to the States. And uh, so I played out my option. I was 38 years old, played out my option. So you were a free agent and you signed with your the club exactly. I always wanted to be with yeah. the Cardinals. Yeah. Yeah. So was it, how did it feel to finally after all these years, you know, I don't know, 15 years, whatever it was. Yeah. You well, finally came full circle and you play for your childhood. I finally family. got to where I wanted to be, but, but I knew in my heart, I, I knew I wasn't the same pitcher that I was earlier. That slider wasn't quite as sure. I can remember being on the mound going, dang, they used to miss that, you know, and now <laughs> they're hitting us and uh, I yeah. just, I was I was running out of gas and uh, uh, I, I got as much out of my career I think as I could possibly have gotten so I, I don't I don't uh, I I remember every pitch and I don't regret any of them or anything. You got to play for Wadi Herzog then too a little bit too again. No, no, I, I, I thought I, you did. I, I didn't, no, he wasn't. Uh, Kenny Boyer was manager when I was there. Didn't uh, and, Herzog didn't come in that last year you were there? Yeah, but I'd already gotten oh, let go. Gone. Yeah. Oh, you'd left. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you missed one another great manager. I did. I did, but but I've known Whitey forever. Yeah. So we used to go hunting together all the time. So. Another guy who's totally different than all these other guys we just talked about, right? True. I they mean, all they they all have their own personality, I guess. Dick Williams was your favorite though? Yes, he was. Dick was my favorite. How about the 
the teammates you've had. And again, we talked about it through this hour that you've had, you've played with some great players, you've played with a lot of Hall of Famers, and I every did. team you played on, even in Washington, where the teams weren't that good, you had uh, as we talked about uh, Howard, um, mm-hmm. and other good players. I mean, who was the, who was the best player you feel like you played with? I've been asked that so many times, and and uh, I, I it's. I, I don't think I could honestly answer it. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'd leave somebody out, but yeah, but I, you're right. I played with so many guys, uh, a lot of Hall of Famers, both pitchers and players. Uh, and obviously, I'm not one of them. But but uh, you know, the I, I got to say the the Montreal club was probably the most talent rich club. And we didn't win it that year. I was there, but I think we finished second. But, but when you look at the head, the outfield was a uh, hawk, the hawk, Andrew yeah. Dawson, yeah, uh, Warren, Warren Cromartie, and the big Ellis Val- Valentine, Ellis Valentine, Ellis Valentine. You had Larry Parrish, uh, uh, Dave Cash, uh, uh, Gary Carter, another Hall of Famer, was the catcher. Yeah. I mean, that was all a good young time. guys, all young guys too. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But uh, that that they didn't stay together very long. I don't know whether it's because the Canadian thing or what it was. But uh, well, Dick Williams was your manager there too, so he was. So he Dick, was. Yeah. How about what if I ask that question a different way? Maybe it's not not any fair than more fair than the one I just asked. Is there a guy because because Richie Allen always comes into my head? Dick Allen comes into my head of guys that didn't get in the Hall of Fame that you feel like or have been slight a little bit. Is there anybody that comes to mind or people, you know, it can, doesn't have to be one guy. Well, he would probably be the one, the one yeah. guy that stands out. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, well, I don't know. You know, I, I, the guys that deserved it seemed like did make it. Guys like Carter. I, Gary Carter is the best catcher I ever threw to. Uh, a lot of people have asked me that. And uh, he just, he had a thing about him. I don't know. Fossey was good. I, I was lucky and in Washington. It was, uh, uh, Casanova. Remember Paul Casanova? Remember sure. That? Yeah, yeah, sure. Jimmy, Jimmy French. They were there. The good catchers. Yeah. It was, I was very fortunate. I mean, a lot of, of course, these guys are major league ball players. I guess you can say they're, 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 they're supposed to be good. And, uh, and they were, it was great memories. And would you say, I, we talked about it during this, uh, conversation is, 69 when you made the all-star team was it your favorite year or was it one of the years with the with the a's or maybe a different year maybe it was your years with st louis i don't know no one no, no, my years st louis like i say i was i was fading out so it wasn't well only because good. you got to play for your hometown team i guess That's yeah that I mean. that part was it was favored but uh uh you know the 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 probably the which i feel is one of the best pitching years i had was uh, uh, I'm trying to think what year it was, but uh, but Ted Williams was the manager. I'm t- I'll lead up to this, and he came to me early in the season in the outfield, and he said, "Every time we are tied or have a lead going into the seventh inning, he said, I'm giving you the ball. You're going to be the pitcher.' Well, I loved that. I thought that's great, you know. And and he did. And my record that year was two and fourteen. Yeah. One, and but I had a two two something low two ERA and and had a lot of saves. But uh, saved like twenty seven games, I think. Yeah, that year. I had a good year, which was good, you know. And but uh, but the, the record obviously was not indicative of that. But 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 it was seemed like every time I gave up a run, I lost a ball game, and that's exactly what happened. So, but well, that the, was one of the best pitching years I ever had. Yeah. Well, they handled the relief pitchers differently then, too, obviously, yeah. as we just talked about a bit. And, you know, you're going to get more losses if you're coming into the high leverage situations and earlier in games and not just to start innings. I mean, they didn't baby you guys and give you every opportunity. No, no they got the most out of you they could. You know. Yeah. I think so, that's one of, one of the reasons today that they do. They, they Maybe these guys are paid so much and and uh, they're, they're afraid they're going to lose them. So they they just kind of baby them a little bit. And I never did agree with it, but. Yeah. The way it is. Well, let me before we go, and I get, we're yeah. running out of time, but I want to touch quickly on your your coaching career. I mean, you you sure. did, you were a long time uh, pitching coach, and and for several organizations in the minor leagues, and you spent a year, I know, with the Phillies, uh, at least a year, 
two uh, years. with the Phillies two years two years at the major league level. I mean, was that something you enjoyed? Did you do you wish that you'd spent more time in the in the majors or and you did it till just I think I don't know how long ago just before COVID you were still a year ago yeah just before yeah. COVID uh, sixty years in pro ball I, I had I think I yeah. kind of felt like that was enough but no I enjoyed coaching I uh, I. I, I was lucky. I knew when I was done as a player, I knew I was done. I, I just, I, I didn't have enough. So I, I wanted to stay in the game. And back then it was, it, uh, it's a little bit different because, you know, we didn't make as much money in the big leagues as, as a player. And most of us, a lot of us needed a job. And, and, and I was lucky enough to stay in the base and stay in the game. And, and, uh, I, I, <sighs> I was only with four organizations and, and I only got fired one time. So yeah, I think that's, that's pretty good. Was pitching coach your, your, I was always a pitching coach until the last three, three years with the blue Jays. And then I was the rehab pitching coach. Yeah. If you will. So did you have any aspirations to do, to actually manage a club or was no, pitching? I never, <laughs> <laughs> I never wanted to manage. No, you never saw enough, what, you saw enough of what your managers went through I that did. you didn't want to. I was happy to be a pitching coach. That's right. <laughs> well, listen, uh, Daryl, I appreciate you being with me today. I've, I've had a great time with you this hour. And I will tell you this. I think you should probably loosen up your arm and get in shape because there's a <laughs> lot of teams can use lefties. And you could probably uh, still go out there and make $5 million a year. Well, I threw batting practice up until a couple of years ago. So every day. So, it, uh, yeah, I always told them, guys, said, you can still pitch. I said, well, move that mound up about five feet and I'll try it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, Daryl, thank you so much. I'm going to, uh, if you want to chat, I'm going to wrap up the show. If you want to chat for a minute or you got to run, I understand if you want to chat I, for a second, once actually, I'm done, I got to run, I got to run, I, but I've enjoyed it. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I had a blast this morning. Thanks again. You have a great weekend. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Daryl Knowles. What a fun hour. That was really a lot of fun for me. I, I I love that era, as you guys know, with some of the guests I get on Friday mornings. This is kind of my nostalgia hour for the most part. And um, I love getting the guys like Daryl on. And, and what a great career he had. I mean, underrated, under the radar. He was a main guy on some teams that weren't as good. And when he was on the better teams, he was, you know, setting up for the guys that were or the stars, if you were. But guys like Daryl Knowles, as you know, from my opinion, guys, uh, on this show, uh, you know, whether they're, they're pitchers or whether they're utility guys or, you know, Greg, the Greg Priors of the world that I talk about a lot of times. And I seem to talk about Greg a lot. One of my first uh, baseball guests, Greg Pryor, but these guys make teams go. So I love it when they come out great stories, um, great recollections. And I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I do. And I hope the groups that I share to this too, I hope you'll share the show, uh, with your friends. And I hope you'll follow TGI Sports Talk, follow Northeast Streaming Sports, and watch us on Zodiac TV. I didn't get a chance to put my banner up for Zodiac TV today. Bad me. I want to welcome the Zodiac TV viewers that are still with us. And we'll see this later. Big news for Zodiac TV, by the way, going live on uh, April 30th on many streaming services. So we'll have more news about that. We could be part of their uh, big launch show. Uh, some of the personalities on Northeast Streaming Sports may be part of that uh, big night for them. Uh, I want to thank again, uh, Daryl, for, for today. I want to thank, uh, again, Larry Sorensen for last week. Coming up next week, Mike Heath, former Yankee, former A, your former Tiger, very, very good Major League Baseball player, played catcher and, and played around the field quite a bit uh, during his career. But we'll have him on in two weeks. Last 30-game winner in the Major Leagues, Denny McLean. So we're going to have some good stuff coming up. We're going to see you Sunday live at 9 a.m. with our Stream of Consciousness show. Bring your topics. I want you guys to give me some topics to chat about. Don't forget April 29th. Only less than a week now. The NFL Draft. I'll be on with Mac and Jack from the Mac and Jack Show. We'll be live on Northeast Streaming Sports, on Zodiac TV, on YouTube, on Facebook, on all the podcast channels that we mentioned. Look for us then. Keith Engel for TGI Sports Talk. You have a great day and a great weekend. See you Sunday.